Okay, folks, we've got a lot to do in the next 14 minutes, and this kind of work only happens if we do it together. So I need everybody with me, yeah? Everybody? Yeah? All right. Here we go. So here we go. I want you to read with me. Is it going to be a read-along? I want you to read. <laughs> I told you, you got, we got to do it together. There's going to be a read-along. Now, this is a quote from a hero of mine, somebody who did what people told him was impossible, and he went out and did it because he understood that impossible was just a word. So let's, let's read together. Come on now. Impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact. Impossible is an opinion. Impossible is a de declaration. It's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. Say, say it again, that last line. Impossible is? There you go, because we're going to need that later. So hold on to that. Remember it. We need it. We need to remember it all the time when we're faced with challenges like we are now in our, in our communities all over the world. This is not unique to the United States. What I'm going to talk about right now is happening all over the world. In the year 2000, when another one of my heroes, Professor Putnam, published a wonderful book that was an exposition on how we are losing our sense of social capital, fancy academic word, for our sense of togetherness, our sense of community, our sense that we're in this together, right? We're getting more and more isolated as society almost like there's a systematic disorganization of communities and society, so that makes for a fairly dangerous time, right? Because if he went back to the beginning of mass media and television and documented how when TV came out, we were able to sit at home and be entertained. We didn't have to go to the theater. You didn't have to go to a community event. You didn't have to go to a sporting event. You didn't have to go to the concert. You could just watch it at home. And that's happening even more now with all the stream streaming we have going on. Every, I mean, how much do we actually go to the movies versus sit at home and, and watch it? When we go to the movies, we're with our community. He gives a great example. This is how he got the name of the book. What he grew up as a, as a bowler in bowling leagues. And so he started his research. He went to bowling alleys figuring, gosh, I bet people aren't bowling as much. Well, when he got there, to his surprise, sure enough, plenty of people were bowling. So he asked the proprietor, the manager, what's going on here? I, you know, my theory is that we're getting more and more isolated. And the answer was, plenty of people are bowling. They're just not bowling in leagues anymore. They're bowling alone. So I commend that book to you if you're interested in this subject, but that story kind of tells you what you need to know. So fast forward 24 years, and the Surgeon General of the United States of America just declared an epidemic of loneliness, right? So if you look at his graphs, I thought about bringing them, but graphs are kind of boring if you ask me, so I didn't want to do that to you. But if you look at his graphs, you'll see that isolation is up and social connection is down in every way, in every trend of data. Th there's no disputing it. We are more and more isolated. We are more and more lonely and into that dark, lonely void. We've all experienced that feeling. Yeah, it's dark in there when you're lonely like that. And that's all over the world, not just here. Into that void steps what I'll call the, the conflict industrial complex. So it's an entire industry built on generating conflict and fear and and avarice to the, to when it gets extreme. There's, there's a whole set of businesses and governments all over the world amplifying the crazy and subduing the moderate voice. Right? And then you, it's, it's right. 
So then you, you get on social media, you all see it if you're on social media, you watch cable news, you listen to podcasts. It's crazy town. And it's, <laughs> I actually have a slide that I'm, I didn't use, but I kind of wish I did. It's me with the Memoji with my head exploding. So, and then I've got another of me getting angry and me getting exhausted and me getting just so fed up with the din of negative and hate and intolerance and hyperbole. I heard today on the news that somebody was accusing somebody else of trying to ban cows. Now, now, so now that's crazy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's crazy. And let me be clear, I'm not trying to ask you to pick a side in any of these fights. I want you to be on the side of humanity, right? Thank you, thank you. And, and the fact that you reacted that way is, is proof of this theory that we are exhausted, right? And if you look, there's data out there that shows it's like this uh, inverted bell curve where the polar voices are loud, 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 screaming at you, feel like everybody's angry all the time, when really, look at us in here sharing this experience. So in our exhaustion and in our isolation, we're ripe for this kind of thing. So it's really up to us to come together as communities to take a stand for ourselves. And I start thinking about in these times, especially when I'm exhausted and think, gosh, I don't know. I, I'm just one person. You're just one person. You're just one person. What can one person do? Then I think about Dr. King and his letter from Birmingham jail and his warning that complacency may be our greatest vulnerability. And I think about famous quote that is now so famous it's become almost cliche. Why? Because it's true. If we don't get it together, not just one of us, but more of us, to take a stand for what kinds of communities we want to live in. If we don't go out and build them, then this machine that is driving the conflict, it's not slowing down. This is age-old behavior. You even see it in the most legitimate, legitimate publications where there'll be a headline that says, so-and-so fears that some wild thing might happen. Well, that's not news. You're not saying something bad is going to happen. They're not going to say it did happen. They're just saying there's a handful of people over here afraid that something's going to happen. That's clickbait. So that's your first clue of how you as an individual can start to take a stand, just all by yourself in front of the, your computer or your phone or wherever you're watching. Now, this advice that we've been getting from Dr. King or Margaret Mead in the last century or so is not new. This quote is 2,000 years old. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? So let's translate into modern language. Stand up for yourself. Stand up with others. And get off of your, and go do it now. Okay, absolutely. Because if we don't, that machine is going to just overwhelm society and pull us apart. So this is kind of dark, I know. I was told to inject some humor here. So, but I, but <laughs> there, okay, that worked. So <laughs> I didn't even have to tell a joke. It's great. The, so, so, um, but I'm reminded of that saying that it's always darkest before the dawn. There's another saying I believe attributable to Paul Newman. That it's always darkest right before it turns pitch black. <laughs> so that, that presents us with a choice, you and me. That presents us with a choice. We're at a fork in the road. So what can we do? History's calling us. How will we answer? So I started thinking a lot about America's greatest generation. History called them, and what did they do? They answered. They showed up by the hundreds of thousands of people. They showed up. They enlisted. They served in factories. They did rationing. They did everything they could to preserve freedom, democracy. 
and a way of life that was at risk at the time. I think a lot about the people who had been marginalized up to that point in American history. Rosie the Riveter, women a generation before couldn't even vote in the United States. I think about the Tuskegee Airmen who two generations, maybe three generations, their ancestors had been enslaved. They showed up to defend freedom and democracy. And imagine they were still living in the, in the segregated America that was then and we're working our way out of now. I think about the Native American code talkers who were run off their land and run off their traditions. They even showed up. They showed up and did something no one else could do. And imagine if, if any of those people, people here at home, people overseas, people in the factories, if they hadn't done what they did, imagine what our lives would look like right now. And some of us in this room right now would not even be here. So we have a wonderful example of what to do when history calls. How will we answer? Well, I'm just one guy. You're just one person. You're just one person. What can we do? One, uh, one thing at a time. I want to show you something. I told you there would be light at the end of this. That's a lot of light. That's 50,000 people in one place at one time lighting candles for peace, single purpose, peace. And think of those values that we all share that are common to all world religions and almost every successful society since the beginning. Kindness, compassion, neighborliness, honesty, all those things that are getting drowned out in today's narrative and what we're, what's constantly in our ears. I don't know about you, but it's making me a little crazy. So I'm to the point where I've got to find something that I can do. History's calling, what can we do? So we already talked about one. You see that clickbait on TV, or excuse me, on online when you're scrolling? Don't click on it. Every time you click on that kind of thing, you give money and power to those who would divide us those who would break communities down because what happens in, those, in that isolation and the darkness of that loneliness, we're more susceptible to even more threat and alarm. Imagine when you're, when you're driving down the road and you're bopping along, Beyonce, you got crazy and love going on. It's really good. I like it. You can tell what I listen to. So, but you, uh, you hear a siren screaming up behind you. You forget all about what you're listening to and you, all of your attention goes to that alarm, to the threat, to the situation that you perceive as somehow needing your immediate attention. That's how we're wired, it's our DNA. And again, this is not new, it's just super powered by technology. So think about it, clickbait. Think about events that are in your community. So every time you click or don't click, that's a choice. That's a fork in the road. You can choose darkest before the dawn or darkest right before it goes pitch black. Now that looks like a, a big sea of people, right? That's a, lo that's a lot of people. But I want you to focus in. Pick a face. Pick, pick one face. Now that person made a decision. That person made a decision to be there. And the person next to them made a decision to be there. And the person next to them made a decision to be there and stand with others, stand up for themselves, to stand with others, and to do it now. Every one of those 50,000 people made that decision on that day. So it's really not that complicated one act of kindness at a time, one click or not click at a time, one community cleanup at a time, one service club membership at a time. And if you can't find a service club that fits you, 
and who you are, then create one. There's an old saying that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. I don't know about you. I don't want to be, be on the menu. And if you don't find a table where you have a seat, you make your own seat. So if there's not a club that fits you, you make that club and invite others to join. Build community. One act of kindness at a time. One act of compassion at a time. One minute of curious listening to why somebody feels differently, looks differently, behaves differently than you. So see, this is not so scary. It's not so overwhelming if we look at it one thing at a time. Now, it just happens that it's my 64th birthday. Thank you. That's really nice. And there's actually a witness to that birth in the room. My 91-year-old mother is right there. So I have proof. So. <laughs> That's very kind, but you're making me run out of time. So, 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 so just quick. Just qu thank you. That was really kind. So here's my birthday commitment, and then I have a birthday wish. You know, if, if you do one thing a day f for 100 days, by the time that 100th day comes along, you've done 100 things. That's a lot. You build a lot of community in 100 days doing 100 things. So that's my commitment to you over the next 100 days on my birthday. My birthday wish is that we go out there and be just be kind to each other. We can do it. Because impossible is nothing. Thank you very much.